do what you want, figure it out yourself. Or this could just be what it is, which is a picture of me at a wedding on the ground when that yin yang twin song Get Love is playing. Either way, I'm Jen Blanks. And this is a list of people who have called me crazy. In an effort to preserve time and get you guys to the open bar, which I'm clearly staring at right now, I would just like to call out a few of them. Because of these people, I have been forced to adopt a mantra that is, don't listen to what anyone ever tells you. Because if I did, and I listened to these people in red tell me that I wasn't good enough, I wasn't cool enough, I wasn't ready enough, I wasn't smart enough, do you know where I would be today? Probably underneath my bed hugging onto a stuffed animal. So I'm thankful that I never, ever, ever listened to these people. This is another picture of me, and this is where my story starts. At the age of 14, and if you can see really close, my shirt says, this shirt is bananas. <laughs> I had braces. I had never had a first kiss. I hadn't yet figured out or strategized how to get a seat with the cool kids at lunchtime, but I did know one thing and one very important thing for a 14-year-old. I wanted to be a writer. So I took an elective class in my high school. I took Journalism 101. I had a teacher, Mr. Backus, uh, and he said, if you want to, you could write for the school newspaper. Just submit a portfolio of your work, and we'll let you know if you make it. And I was like, oh my god, this is like my bright star, my big opportunity. I'm going to write for the school newspaper, then I'm going to go to college and major in journalism. From there, I'm going to work at the New York Times. After that, I'll probably win a couple of awards here or there for some stories I write. I'm going to be a famous writer, and I'm only 14. So I put together my portfolio. I found my best clips of writing that I've done in class so far, and I handed it to him in a nice blue folder, and I waited patiently for the list to go up. And the list went up of the students that made the high school newspaper staff. And I scrolled through the list about five times before realizing my name wasn't on there. So what did I do? I marched up to Mr. Backus and I said, oh my goodness, I think that when you printed the list, you forgot to print page two because that's where my name was supposed to be. And I don't know why I'm not on this list. And he looked at me and he pulled down his thick rimmed black glasses and he said, oh no, Jen, you're not on that list for a reason. You're not a good writer, and you're probably never going to be a good writer, so do yourself a favor now at this young age and do anything else. And that's when I learned something called laugh, book, and launch. But I would be lying to you if I didn't say that I didn't go home that night and cry my eyes out and have to look at my mother who looked at me and said, okay, Jen, you have two choices. You can listen to him, this washed up teacher, who's going to crush your dreams, or you could not listen to him. And the worst thing you can do when you're upset is go to your mother. You want to know why? Sorry, Mom, if she ever listens to this, but you want to know why? Because they'll make you feel better about yourself. And when you're down in the dumps, you don't want to feel better about yourself. You want to bask in the sympathy for yourself, and you just don't want to hear it. But I listened to her. And I went up to Mr. Backus, and I laughed in his face. Because that's the only thing that you can truly do when somebody tells you that you're not good enough. Because what's the alternative, right? And I've learned throughout my life that more people will tell you that you're not good enough, that you can't do something, than they won't. So you have to first laugh at them. And then after you laugh at them, you have to look at them. Okay? Because you want to remember that moment for the rest of your life. And that's because those are the moments that truly shape the rest of your journey. Because once you hear someone say you can't do something, if you have that fire inside of you, oh, let me tell you, you will do something. And that's the launch part. So what did I do? I was reading my local newspaper one day, and I noticed that there was a program for high school students to write. And I applied there, I got, that, got into that program, and guess what, they paid. I got, finally got my first check for writing of $15, but I was like, oh my god, I made it huge. I'm going to go buy 15 slices of pizza with this or something. And then after that, I wrote for them for four years. And on my fourth year, when I graduated from high school, I won the High School Correspondent of the Year Award. And I took that award. It was quite heavy. And I dragged it to school, and I slapped it on Mr. Backus's desk. And I laughed, I looked, and I launched. Got the heck out of there. So we move on a couple of years, and here's another picture of me smiling at my college graduation. 
next stop from graduation would be on the Upper East Side of my parents' house, back in my twin-size bed, alongside my clay and posters, and my beanie babies that were worth just as much as my poetry degree. But I knew I wanted to be a writer. I just didn't know who was going to be the one to pay me to do that. So I opened up a local magazine, I looked up the editor-in-chief, I walked right into her office, and somehow I convinced her to hire me as a magazine assistant for $8 an hour. She happened to look identical to Corella DeVille. I promise you that, it is crazy. But not only did she look like Corella DeVille, she acted like that too, because instead of being a magazine assistant in writing, my job duties were to go to her house and set up her Christmas decorations. I had to wrap her holiday presents. She had two dogs in the office that had to scoop up their poop whenever they decided to poop in the office, which was hourly. And when I did have the opportunity to write, which is what I wanted to do, she called me into her office once a week, slapped down my writing on the table and said, Jen, you are not a good writer. Do something else. So here I was again, in a position that I wasn't happy, that I was miserable, that I knew what I wanted to do, but the world was telling me not to. And that is when I learned that you cannot wait until conditions are perfect to begin something. In fact, the best time to make changes are when you are personally miserable and done with something. If you wait until they're perfect, hate to break it to you, they're never going to be perfect. And when they are perfect, you're going to feel so good about them that why would you want to mess them up? I also learned that you have to respect yourself enough to walk away from anything that no longer aids you develops you, or makes you happy. So I went to Bank of America in my local town in Florida, and I asked them to withdraw every single paycheck, every dollar I had in the account. I think I had about $563 to my name, and I pulled all of that out. I bought a one-way plane ticket on JetBlue Airlines from Fort Lauderdale, Florida to JFK. From there, I went to 15 job interviews in one week. I was applying for about 384 jobs all month before I had moved there. When I got to New York, I went on 15 job interviews. I only got one job. It was in PR, but I figured I would take it. And that's when I moved to New York officially. That's me eating pizza because <laughs> that's really all I could afford working as a you know, bottom person in the PR industry living in New York, trying to figure out my dreams and my life. But once again, I was working in PR, and I still knew I wanted to be a writer. And I figured if I couldn't get a job writing, because every job I tried to get writing for a newspaper or a magazine or a company, they wanted to pay me less money than I had ever you know, earned in my life. I couldn't even survive in care. I remember I got a job interview at um, a magazine where they wrote about children's sneakers. I knew nothing about children's sneakers. Um, but I, I was going to take it. And I went through the interview process, and he's handing me the paperwork to sign. And I'm like, oh, by the way, how much, how much does this job pay? He's like, oh, $20,000 a year. And I was like, oh, my god. Like, I'm having, like, you know, acid reflex here. Like, how am I supposed to, like, live on $20,000 a year? And I was like, listen, like, I'll take the job, but then could you pay me more if I do sales for you, if I work the front desk? I'll even go distribute the magazine around town. Can you just pay me a little bit more? And he said, listen, honey, it doesn't matter how good of a writer you are, we'll find someone else who can take the job for 20000 So either take it or leave it. And I had to leave it. But I still wanted to be a writer, and I didn't want to give up on that. So the only way to do it was to figure out a way to do it myself. And that's when I started my tiny blog, The Things I Learned From. I think um, my first reader was, of course, my mother. And my readership doubled overnight when my dad started reading it. And then it doubled again when my two best friends started reading it. And from there, you know, I get a new reader maybe once every six months. Um, but I wasn't writing it for people to read, okay? I was writing it because I needed a home for my writing. It's what I wanted to do. And I couldn't get paid for it, but it didn't matter because I was happy writing. So I wrote, 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 and I thought to myself, Maybe I could get published on these websites, like there's Thought Catalog, there's Huffington Post. Uh, maybe, you know, I, I think I'm good enough to write for them too. So I would send my work from my blog to these places once a week. And every single week I would get a rejection letter back that said, not good enough, or the writing's just not there yet, or we, we can't see this fitting in with our audience. And I said, okay, fine. So for two full years I wrote once a week on my website. And I also sent the writing to everyone else, and I got rejected for every single week straight for two years. 
until two years later, they were sick and tired of hearing from me. A person from Thought Catalog called me up and said, all right, Jen, we know who you are around here. We're gonna let you write for free, of course. Um, and he's like, let me give you a little hint. If you want to build your career, your platform, you need to write for us as much as you can during the week. And I was like, oh my god, I, I have a home. You know, my, my writing has a home. My readership on my blog was a total of five. One of those people I was paying, you know, like paying with like pizza and chores to read it, my roommate. Um, so I was thrilled to have a home for my writing. And when he gave me that little secret to write a lot for them, because that would build my name, my following, my presence, I wrote five times a week for them. I wrote everything. I bared my soul. The things I wrote for the internet back then in 2011 still haunt me. I wrote about everything from first dates to, you know, relationships breaking apart and personal feelings that I had. I bared my soul. I literally cut myself open and threw out everything and gave it to Thought Catalog. Which led me to Anthony. Anthony, and I call him Anthony the Ant, because Anthony was a book agent. And it was so cool because I was writing for Thought Catalog, um, you know, five times a week, and I had all these readers now. My readers went from five to a hundred, and I was like, yeah, there's a hundred people who are reading my writing? That's like a dream. And Anthony, the Ant agent, called me up, and he's like, hey, I've been reading you on Thought Catalog, and I'm going to get you a book deal. I nearly fainted. In fact, I'm pretty sure I did faint, um, and I just was kind of on the floor, hyperventilating, crying, screaming, laughing. I don't know what. I, I thought my, you know, my whole my whole dream life was happening. I was going to be an author, and Anthony was going to make my dreams come true. And that's what he promised me. We met in person the first time. He said, "Jen, I'm going to make you a star." And I was like, "Yes, Anthony, make me a star." Uh, never trust anybody who tells you they're going to do anything for you. Because a week later, he called me up and he's like, Jen, sweetheart, you don't have enough Twitter followers to be a star. I was like, Twitter followers? I'm a writer. I don't need to be like a social media queen. Um, your writing is, is not good enough yet to be a star, to be an author, to publish a book. And um, nobody wants to read a book about dating stories. Because that's the book I wanted to write. I was writing about dating for Thought Catalog. It was my you know, persona. It was what I was doing. It was what I was good at. And he's like, no one wants to read a book about another 20-something dating life. We got enough of that out there, I can't sell it. And I was like, but Anthony, you promised you were gonna make me a star. You know, what happened? And that's when I realized one of the biggest lessons in business and career and in life, if somebody else cannot get you an opportunity, and they will never be able to get you the opportunity faster than yourself, do it yourself. I wrote the book in two months. I asked my friends over at Thought Catalog who were publishing my writing if they would put it up as an ebook, and they did. I spent every day for two additional months when the book came out marketing it myself. I had no marketing experience. I majored in poetry. But I would wake up every single morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I would Google podcasts and websites and blogs and influencers and people who I can send a free copy to who I asked to review. I don't know what I was doing at 4 a.m., but I was working my butt off. And I did that every single day for two months. I marketed the book myself. I wanted people to read this. I wanted them to review it. I wanted them to tell me what was up. I wanted them to read it. And I published it, and it was out there, and I marketed it. And somehow, it became a bestseller on Amazon beside David Sedaris and Ellen's book. It's not that funny. I don't know how it got there. And it became a bestseller on the humor books on iTunes, right down here. Um, and that's simply because I didn't give up on myself. And I learned at a very young age that you cannot listen to other people when they tell you things. It will destroy your life. If I had listened to my 14-year-old teacher who said I was never going to be a writer and I was never good enough, I have no idea what job I would be doing now. But I don't think I would be very happy because there was always a fire inside of me that said, write, 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 write. So I figured out a way to get people to read this crazy little thing. And then I turned 26, and as you saw that in the book is all my friends are engaged. They all got engaged. And I was a bridesmaid a million times. Hated it. Um, any disposable income I had went to weddings. I'm not joking. I paid for so many polyester ugly dresses. I paid for bachelor parties to places that I never ever want to go again, like Vegas and Cancun and Atlantic City. 
I paid for things for the bride that I should never have had to pay for. I bought all of these fancy shoes to wear for just eight hours. I spent hundreds of dollars having someone take a curling iron and curl my hair and put fake eyelashes on because that's what the bride told me I had to have. It was absurd. I hated it. Also during that time, I was working a full-time job at a startup. I loved my job, but it wasn't enough. I had this revelation that yes, I always wanted to be a writer, and now I was writing, I had a full-time job writing, I had written a little book, I had my blog. I wanted to do something else, I wanted to do something different. And this is the thing that no one ever tells you that kills me, kills me so deep inside, is that we're not meant to just do one thing, but yet we're told throughout our lives that we are. We have to choose a major before freshman year ends, and we have to get an internship with that major and a job after school in that major too, but Yes, we can love one job, but we can love so many other things. We're such dimensional people. We have so many skills, yet we only ever used one, and it's not right. And I realized I was missing something. I had this love for writing, but I also had a love for so many other things. I wanted to try sales. I wanted to try marketing. Maybe back to PR. I had no idea. I mean, this is what my resume practically looked like. I was 26 years old, and my resume looked like I was having five midlife crises before I was even middle of my 20s. I had done five different jobs. I had lived in three different states. I was a disaster on paper. I had no idea what to do. I knew I wanted more. I also started to dread having a boss who would put a calendar invite on my calendar once a year to give me a 2% raise. I hated having to email and beg to take off an hour to go to the dentist for a cleaning. I hated that I was given a list of five tasks and five tasks only. If I ever wanted to, you know, put my hands in another department, it was like, whoa, what is Jen doing here? I didn't like that. I felt like I was suffocated. I couldn't breathe. I wanted more. One day, actually one day, Two years ago and two days ago, it's a peak. Remember these days when you have these big epiphanies. I got coffee with these two girls. They ran an organization and I wanted to be a speaker there because while I was a mess on paper, which was true, I wanted to admit that to people. I, I felt as though there was nobody walking around saying, I'm a mess, everything's gonna be okay. It was like everyone, all my friends had like these great careers. Every year they were moving up from assistant to associate to senior to this, and they were getting married, and their lives were so perfect, but there was no one speaking out about being a mess, and I wanted to be that person, so I approached these two girls, I got coffee with them on a Friday night two years ago and two days ago, and I said, I'm Jen Glantz, and I want to speak at your next event about being a mess, <laughs> and they slurped down their espressos, and they were like, Jen, uh, you're nobody, we don't want you at our event, I swear, these were the exact words they said. Because I had left there at like 9 p.m. and I got ice cream. I was like, I'm gonna cry. I'm like, I'm not a nobody. And I went home and I opened up my computer and I sat there and said, I'm sick of this life that I'm living. I'm sick of feeling bad for myself. I'm sick of working a job and coming home and wanting more. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of being told you can only fall in love with one thing and not do anything else ever. I want more for my life. My life was already a mess on paper. I didn't have much to lose. Whatever I did next probably would make my resume look a little bit you know, more diverse and interesting. So I opened up my computer. I went to a website my mother told me never, ever, ever to go to, which was Craigslist.com. <laughs> I opened up women looking for women section, not because I wanted to date, because I had an idea. What was the biggest problem in my life at that time? Being a hypo. I was like oddly good at it because that day, two years, two days ago, that very same day, I had two friends call me up and ask me to be their bridesmaid. And it was really weird because we weren't even good friends. Like I hadn't spoken to one of them in five years and the other one I hadn't spoken to in a year and I was like, why are you calling me? Like, is everything okay? <laughs> and I came home and I told my roommate, I'm like, Carrie, like, what is going on with this world today? Like, two friends asked me to be a bridesmaid, and I don't even know what their like permanent mailing address is. I have no clue where they are. <laughs> and she's like, Jen, girl, you've become a professional bridesmaid. And I was like, whoa. You know? 
And I'm sitting there that Friday night after going to that bad meeting and crying over ice cream and have my computer open, I have Craigslist open, and I'm like, okay. Hate being a bridesmaid, but I'm really good at it for some bizarre reason. To wear polyester like nobody else. And I wrote this Craigslist ad saying, let me be your bridesmaid, strangers of the world. I will do things for you that your friends just don't want to do anymore, like help you pee in a wedding dress, because peeing in a wedding dress is really hard. <laughs> I will dance with your drunk uncles because there's always a couple of those and nobody ever wants to dance with them. And I'll be there for you when nobody else can or they're too busy or you just don't have that right person in your life. I wrote this ad. It was probably by 10.30 p.m. by this point. I shut my computer, went to sleep, didn't tell a single person that I did that because why? If I did, they would have called me crazy. They would have said, Jen, it's time to get a hobby or a dog. But girl, stop posting things on Craigslist offering your services. <laughs> so I didn't tell anyone. And I figured nothing would ever happen. I had felt better about myself. I put something out there in the universe, and I felt like that was all I could really do. Two days later, I'm back at work. It's Monday morning. I'm on Gchat, because that's the only way to survive a day, is just Gchatting your friends, articles, and gifts. And a friend Gchatted me a link to a BuzzFeed article. And I click the article and it says, Anonymous girl posts an ad about being a bride man on Craigslist. And I write back in the G chat box and caps, I'm like, oh my god, that is me. And my friend goes, I know, Jen, like, you should have thought of this first. It's so you. <laughs> and I write back, I'm like, oh my god, no, no, that is me. And I can't breathe, and I'm having a panic attack. And I find the phone number of BuzzFeed.com. I call up the, you know, the main office. I'm like, hello, BuzzFeed.com. This is Jen Glantz. They're like, what do you want? You know, what, what do you want? And I was like, that's my ad. And they added my name to the ad. What happened from then on has been a complete, complete, complete horror. This, oh, well, this is me as a bridesmaid. Um, and this is me. I was always meant to be a bridesmaid. Like, that's me at four with like, a wedding veil on. It was just, just natural. That's the ad that I posted. Um, I didn't tell my job about this, of course, because what if they found out, you know? I, I didn't even know what this was. It was an idea. I'm a poetry major. How do you start a business? I have no idea. Uh, and I just tried to play it cool. It was 3 o'clock by that point. I was like, just play it cool, play it cool, play it cool. And all of a sudden, a guy with a camera walks into my full-time job. And he's like, is there a Jenny Lance? And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, walked him out and I was like, leave me alone. And then my mom's calling me from Florida because there's reporters calling my house in Boca Raton, Florida, looking for a giant glance. And I had to call my mom, but mom, I did something, you told me never to do. <laughs> Sorry. And I had to tell her and I had to tell everyone. Um, and people wanted to know, you know, what was I thinking? What was this business? And I went on live TV two days after posting the ad and said, oh, this is a free service, of course. I'll be your bridesmaid for free. I don't know anything about business. Like, whatever, I'm not gonna get paid. Um, and then I checked my inbox. I actually had created a fake email address when I posted the ad. So I didn't want to get like spam through Texas. I don't know how that works, but the email address was do I get a plus one at gmail.com. <laughs> and <laughs> that email address got so many responses, so many emails from and the Gmail shut it down because they thought it was spam. I had 400, 600, 800 emails from brides all around the world who wanted to learn more about this business. They wanted to hire me. They were getting married and they were saying, oh my God, this is the worst period of my life. I need help. And when nobody tells you about getting married or planning a wedding, which I will tell you right now and ruin the magical secret, is that it is the worst time. It's like Disney World, okay? People think Disney World is the greatest place on earth, but it's not. It's filled with sweaty people who are eating those big chicken legs. And it's the same thing with weddings. It's filled with sweaty people who are eating chicken legs, but more fancy kind of chicken legs. Um, and the bride just had nobody there for them. And I somehow had created a profession that didn't exist. I saw a gap in an industry that was a billion dollar industry. And I noticed when I was behind the scenes at weddings that there was nobody there for the bride. If she had bridesmaids, great. They were busy getting their hair done, looking for the open bar, looking at the cute groomsmen. If she had a wedding planner, 
They were busy doing things for the venue, setting up the cake, the flowers, the chairs. Nobody was there for the main character of the wedding of the bride. So, I put together some packages based on the emails I received. Last year in 2015, which was my first year in business, I worked with over 40 brides. This right here is Ashley. She was the first person to hire me. Again, I had no clue what I was doing, but I got on a flight to Minnesota and I stood by her side as her bridesmaid. I actually didn't charge her a penny. She was my trial on bride. I wanted to test out my services. I wanted to see how this whole thing was gonna work. I got on that plane to Minnesota. Flight attendant had to drag me off the damn plane. I was so nervous. She's like, what are you here for? I'm like, well, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm going to a wedding as a bridesmaid. I have never had the bride before. And she was like, girl, did you like have a couple too many on the ride over? And I was like, no, 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 this is my new job. And um, I did it, and I got home, I got back on that flight, and I realized, wow, there is a need for this, and I'm gonna figure it out. I have a virtual bride over here, Elle, who I worked with virtually for a year. Uh, this is Rod and Buck from Australia. They weren't able to get married in Australia, but they were able to have a wonderful wedding in New York City. Um, this is one of my brides who I touched the poison ivy for, so she could take a picture. Um, this is one of my brides, Laura. I walked her dog down the aisle. Uh, these are two of my brides who got married in Las Vegas, and when they were walking down the aisle, uh, there was animal, it was outside their wedding, and there was animal droppings on the aisle, and I picked up the animal droppings with my hand and moved them over. Um, this job is a dirty, dirty job. But I also had a ton of people call me crazy. Say that I was, this is such a joke, this can't be a real business, right, Dad? You're so crazy, why would you ever want to do this? Are you scared someone's gonna steal you? I was like, who wants to steal this mess? And it's been three minutes with me and be like, someone else take her. No, I wasn't scared. And I realized then that when you find out what you love, love the hell out of it. Even if it makes no sense to other people. And this is a real life screen grab from when I was on the Steve Harvey show and he stared at me for three minutes and 40 seconds like I was an alien. <laughs> I can't even tell you how many times I was on live TV where they said to me, you are crazy, or we don't think this is a good idea, or your business is stupid, and I had to defend it. Because if you don't love what you're doing, the world won't. If you don't believe in what you're doing, why should anybody else? But, things happen, and about nine months in to running this business, that to be honest with you, I had no clue what I was doing, right? I was a poetry major. I was running a business that was literally held together by scotch tape. I had no clue what I was doing. I was just getting by. The media was having a blast covering me and my experiences, but if they really knew what it looked like, it would be an embarrassment. One night, nine months in, I threw the towel in the air. I said, I'm done, man. I'm working full time. I'm doing this business from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. and then 6 p.m. to midnight. I'm exhausted. I hadn't seen my friends in a year and a half. I didn't go out anymore, and when I went out, I was thinking about all the things I had to do when I got home. I ruined complete relationships. I had guys say to me, Jen, it's me or your business. And I was like, oh, you know, you're cute and everything, but it's my business, you know? I ruined a lot. I didn't have a personal social life. I had a business, and it got very tolling. So one night, nine months in, I opened up my computer, where all good stories start with Jen, and I Googled free business tutors in New York City. I was desperate and I had no money. When you start a business, you're not very profitable at first and all the money you make goes straight back into your business. I didn't have a paycheck from that business. But I did get matched with a business tutor who had many years of experience and who was gonna help me figure out what the heck I was doing. He taught me, well, we'll go back to that, but here he is. This is Ray, it's a really dark picture because um, Ray's not very photogenic, he says, but he's also 86. And this is who the wonderful city of New York matched me with. And when I went to see Ray for the first time, I sat down and said, Hi, Ray, I'm Jen Lynn, I'm the founder of Brides Me For Hire. He said, get out. <laughs> and I was like, oh my god, what did I do, Ray? Like, you know, should I repeat myself? And he's like, don't ever talk to me in that tone of voice again. And I was like, oh god, this guy Ray is going to really bring me back down to earth, and God knows what else. Uh, and I talked to Ray for a little while, and he said, enough. 
I don't understand your business. I don't like your business. To be honest, I don't like you. <laughs> I was like, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. And he said to me, if you want to sit in this chair for any amount of time longer, I'm going to need you to tell me how you failed this week. And I was like, oh my god, like, what did the city of New York send me to? You know, I'm like trying to get business advice, and this guy's like asking me how I failed. Who talks about failure? I was so new to the startup world, and what I knew about on, and, you know, entrepreneurs and startups is that when you do fail, and we all do, we don't talk about it. We brush it underneath the table. Who do you see posting on Instagram like, oh, I had a bad day, I lost five customers, I can't pay my bills? You don't see that. You see people post pictures of their WeWork space and their cool offices and their fun happy hours out. No one talks about failures, and when they have them, they Photoshop them, they Instagram filter them, they put so many hashtags, they're disguised, they're not failures anymore, they're disguised as pure success. I didn't have a list of failures to tell him because I never thought about it. When I failed, I had suppressed it. So he kicked me out and he said, never, ever come back. If you've learned one thing about me so far, it's that I don't listen to anybody. And they tell me not to come back, where do you think I'm going to be next Saturday? And I walked in, and I slapped a paper on the desk that had 25 ways I had failed that month. And Ray said, okay, fine, I'll officially start working with you. He taught me, fail hard, fail fast, and fail forward. What happens when you don't aim for failure, which is also something nobody in your life will ever tell you. Aim for failure, not success. You learn a whole lot more from your failure than you ever will from success. And in fact, when you fail, you're actually steps closer to reaching your end goal. You just don't realize it, you get nervous, and you run away. But what Ray told me that I'll never, ever forget, it haunts me in my dreams, is that regret makes you human. It's true. A lot of us do things, we don't do things all the time, we just forget about it, we move on. So regret makes you human. But failure, failure makes you a hero. So when you fail, you might as well do it fast. You might as well try things right now. Never wait too long to start something. Try right now and aim to fail. See what happens. I introduce new packages, new services all of the time, and they fail. But you know what I learned when they fail? I learned what, why they failed. And then I'm able to relaunch it and get a huge success rate, a lot of new clients. But if I sat back and strategized too much and became too wrapped up in my head, you know what would happen? You know where I would be? Back underneath my parents' twin-sized bed in their house, hugging onto a stuffed animal. And when you fail forward, that means you don't give up. You look at failure, you laugh at it. You look at it, and then you launch. So my advice to you, I told you the deepest, darkest secrets about my personal career journey, is that I beg you, I will get on my hands and my knees. I will beg you. I will squeeze you so tight. I beg you, start right now. There will never be a good time to get started on a career change or on a building your own business. You gotta start right now. Even if you're not ready, everything's not perfect, your life's a mess, that's okay. My life is a mess 360 days of the year, and I still find a way to function and put myself together decently. Don't ever give up. The difference between you and somebody who's on the Today Show is that they sent that 16th follow-up email. That's the secret of PR, summed up for you in a sentence. Don't plan too much. You could write these mastermind business plans, but you know what? It's not going to get you very far. You might as well go out there, get a couple clients, give them your service or your product for free, have them test it out, see what happens. That is how you start. That is how you plan. You don't write and strategize in your head. You won't go anywhere. Smooch failure alone. When there's a failure, embrace it. Talk about it. Be honest about it. It promise you, if you turn to the person next to you and say how you failed today, they will take a deep breath and be like, oh, me too. It's a great conversation starter. It's a terrible thing to do on a first date, though. <laughs> go your own way. It was hard for me to, to live this life because the majority of my friends are from Florida. They were married with kids by the time I was still on my eighth job. I was living this career path, this crazy life that to people seemed like I was lost. I was misguided. I had no clue. I knew what I was doing all along because when you 
don't know what you want to do, you're supposed to do anything. And that's what I was doing. So people may not understand what you want to do, who you want to be. Your friends might look at you and say, just go work in that cubicle, it'll be fine. And your parents might say, just go to grad school and get that one more degree. But do what you want to do and do it yourself. Go your own way. And remember, and this is what I want to absolutely leave you with, because I realize this every single day of my life, is that you are already everything. You are smart enough, you are brave enough, you are ready to do what you want to do. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not, even yourself. We are capable of so much more than we do on a daily basis. We're only really doing one thing every day at our job, but guess what? We are capable of so much more, and we know that, we feel that occasionally, and it scares the hell out of us, but it is the truth. You already have all of the tools that you need inside of you. You just need to admit to yourself that you do. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm Jen Lance.